We're going to talk about different Kubernetes tools in this video and provide a high level overview of them. To start with this, I'm actually going to talk about why eventually you'll probably likely reach and look for deploy tools on top of the kube control command. It first starts off pretty simple. You just have to deploy YML and service YML and you're thinking, okay, this is great. This is all I really need. I can just use kube control. I'm done. Okay. So this is actually pretty simple and I kind of agree. This is all, if all you're deploying, then you're kind of good. Okay. But what's going to happen in the real world is you actually, you're going to reach out for different resources, such as like a config map or a secret. Typically, most people as a best practice don't hard code their configuration values into the Docker image. They actually will put that configuration value as a separate entity and then include it as a reference. So that's what config maps and secrets will help you do. And this is just an example of using config map and you see the arrows pointing to the names of the config map. The reason why I have arrows pointing to the names of the config map is people who are, once you get used to Kubernetes, basically you're gonna find out that when you deploy a deployment, uh, you need to actually update the config map name or it doesn't take effect because the deployment is only aware of the name. It's not aware of the actual contents of the config map or the secret. So basically to hack around this, you have to change the name and then the deployment is going to deploy out the new data changes properly. Now, this is actually a pretty horrible process because it's very manual and error prone, right? So people don't really like it. So some people will resort to actually just doing a kube control rollout restart deployment. Basically, it's just going to restart the deployment in place, okay? And it's going to kind of force that configuration value, but that does result in a blip of downtime. So most people actually recommend actually renaming, okay? And then doing the apply on the deployment and then basically deleting the old version. And again, this is a very error prone process and it's not very ideal. You also, if you're using kube control uh, directly like this, then what's going to happen is you have to also worry about the order. You have to worry about that. You have to worry that you have to apply the cube, the config map, the secret first, because the deployment relies on those resources or else the deployment might basically say, Hey, the config map doesn't exist. So you do have to worry about the right order too. If you're using cube control kind of directly, let's say you're also going to start to deploy multiple applications. Most people, when they're again, starting off, what they do is just like, look, let's just deploy everything in the default namespace. Let's keep everything simple. Let's deploy it in the, uh, in the same namespace. So here's just an example here. We're seeding into Bob, we're running four commands to do the Bob deployment. And then you're going to seed in Kevin, you run the four similar command, store, store it the same thing. So you run 12 commands, then you end up with something like this. You end up with basically all the pods, all the services, all the deployments, all the secrets and config map, all in the same namespace, the default namespace here. So that starts to get a little bit overwhelming and it just feels a little dirty. And this is only with three applications. What happens when you get five to five, six, seven applications? This doesn't get worse and worse and worse, right? Especially if you have more than two pods running. It just, and then also you're gonna probably use additional resources. So again, it gets a little bit messy and dirty and it's just, there's no boundaries here. Some people will try to say, why don't you just use the filter? It's really easy, just dash L app equals Bob there. And it's nice and pretty now. But I will say that this is a trade-off. What's we are trading off is a longer command that you have to remember now uh, you know, versus basically actually using something called namespaces. So this is what actually people do in order to kind of clean up basically that big list view, they start grouping things in namespaces, basically application resides in namespace. And this is what namespaces are designed for. So I actually think this is really, uh, the way to do it. You just group, uh, the apps that are one app into one namespace. And you just basically add the namespace to all these configuration files. Now there's a bunch of arrows here to all these, uh, to where the namespace is, is because this is also kind of a little bit annoying. You know, this is a lot of duplication. If you have more resources, you have to make sure to add that namespace. And you also have to make sure not to type that incorrectly. <laughs> you're gonna end up copy and pasting a lot. And then you're, you're at some point you're gonna be like, oops, I didn't put the right namespace in and I deployed the wrong namespace. Okay. So again, this is not ideal and very error prone. We haven't even talked about multiple roles yet. So this is a common pattern I've seen. A common pattern is that people deploy the same app code, but then they start off a different process, like a web process, a worker or a clock process to do different things. But essentially they're deploying the same code. Okay. So if you want to handle this, one way to handle this is you just go deploy dash web dash worker dash clock dot YML. So now you have three different deployments that takes care of your three different processes, but you also have lots of duplication of deployment at YML. Essentially the only difference is basically the startup command for the Docker container. Right? That's a lot of duplication here at the change in three places. 
And we haven't even talked about different environments yet, which is a pretty common requirement also. People usually want a dev environment, a prod environment, maybe a test or key or UAT environment, right? So how you can do that? Well, I guess you can just go dev at the end, test at the end, and web at the end, okay? Now, you see the permutation is just increasing here. Like, you're gonna have massive duplication everywhere, right? And so this is kind of where you're at when you're kind of using cube control kind of directly. So what happens is people end up reaching out for tools, okay? So they start looking for tools in space or maybe they even might wanna write their own tool, even a wrapper script, but even the wrapper script, the requirements are, I don't even think they're that complicated. It's just, it's a little bit uh, difficult to kind of use or manage all these YML files with kind of these requirements. So here are some of the tools. I'm only covering them kind of really briefly in this video. Customize, Helm, and Cubes are kind of the main tools I'm going to be co uh, covering. So Customize is a tool that's actually now baked into the Cube Control CLI. Uh, it used to be a standalone tool and it's still available as a standalone tool. So you're going to see some documentation out there or people using the standalone tool separately. And you're going to see some people using the Cube Control Customize uh, built-in tool also. They all do the same thing, I would say. That customized tool by itself is a, a probably has some more additional features uh, because they've only merged some parts of customize in. But essentially, uh, most people I think will you you you'd be pretty good just using Q control customize. And the way uh, customize works is it just provides with some essentially helper methods in your YML files to generate let's say config uh, maps or secrets in a way that's like in one central spot. So that's really nice. It also provides additional fields like common labels so then you can only define all your labels in one spot. And it also provides this really handy idea of overlays. So basically you have like a base customize.yml file that pretty much uh, controls everything. And then you have like overlays like a dev customize.yml file and that will, those two customized files will know how to combine each other and all the other deployment and service files together. I'm just explaining this at a very high level, but it's essentially a very purest YML approach to extending uh, the YML and kind of trying to get rid of and reduce some of the duplication. Helm uh, is a package manager. It describes it as a package manager because it really is. It's a little bit more broader in scope than what Customize does. Custom uh, Customize is basically just uh, merging YML files together. Helm uh, is actually like a full package manager where you actually can add repos. You can search for packages within these repos and you can install packages, okay? But Helm also can be used as a deployment mechanism and the configuration files for Helm uh, is exactly like a regular uh, Kubernetes YML file, except you'll see a lot of curly brackets in there because it's a templating language. So instead of having like this concept of overlays, all it has is variables and you can substitute variables via the templating language and you can even put like conditionals and some logic in there. You can see an if statement right there, okay? But it's very much more heavily focused on here's a templating language, okay? Cubes, okay, uh, is, uh, and I, I should, uh, disclosure, this is a tool I wrote because I actually messed around with both Helm as well as Customize and I thought it didn't fit right for what I was trying to do, which was focus actually on app deployment, okay? But Qs basically kind of tries to take the best of both. Uh, it does have some templating language uh, built in with ERB in this case. Uh, and it also has that concept of overlays. It ca it's called layering, except it does it in a very conventional way. So you actually don't really have to type as much, okay? But it allows you to merge and combine different basically YML files together and reduce a lot of duplication also. So these are three tools that kind of try to address this problem of uh, duplication, repeating yourself, and just manual error prone work that you shouldn't be doing, okay? Um, now, I only covered these three tools in a very high level because this is meant to be an introductory video. Uh, in additional videos, what I'm doing is I'm gonna do a deep dive into each of these tools and cover the pros and cons and merits of kind of using each. And then eventually, um, you, it's kind of up to you to decide which one is kind of the best fit for you, okay? So hopefully, that introduction to these tools and why these tools are around are, are helpful. Okay, cheers.